Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time it may be when you are first viewing this video. What I'm intending to do here is getting us kick-started in our next unit on Christology, which, as you can see from the schedule, is um, the Domineum et Vivicantum, which is basically the life of the spirit within the church. And we're going to be doing a lot of what we did last semester with slowly going through a couple of encyclicals that have to do with our class topic, which for this semester is um, Christology, so the study of Christ. So these two encyclicals that we're going to be looking at are going to be uh, formatted around basically Christ, right? So what have the popes or the church as a magisterium, as a teaching body, talk to us about Christ, right? So if you look at the Google Calendar, I'm going to try to stay as close to basically what I had planned out as possible. Please stay up to date with the Google Classroom updates. Um, it's going to be the same format. It's going to look a lot of the same like if we were in the classroom, minus the fact that we aren't in the classroom. But I am still going to expect you to turn in assignments on time um, and that you still should be getting those updates through your uh, school email concerning when those assignments will arrive and when they're due and whatnot. So please stay on task. This could, this could snowball pretty badly if uh, you sit back especially since uh, we're dealing with material that might be a little bit over grade level a bit. So what I'm going to be doing is I'll be doing a series of videos maybe, uh, but for the most part definitely giving you some pointers on how to tackle this document. Um, for today's purposes, I'm going to give you kind of an introduction and a summary of each section. I'm going to go through the entire document uh, in a summative way, but we're not going to deal with the entire document. As you can see, we're only going through paragraphs 1 through 24. There's about 67 paragraphs in this encyclical, so we're only going to cover about a third of it. Um, and as you can see on the far right here, that uh, the things that I'm going to want you guys to look at are the main ideas in each paragraph, uh, things that you had learned through the paragraph, and then any questions that you may have regarding the assignment, or I mean the, the paragraphs that we're dealing with. Um, so a lot of like what we were doing last semester uh, with the encyclicals. Um, and you can see here on the left in this column uh, that the paragraphs have been broken up into smaller bite sizes for us to digest. All right, so as you can kind of predict here, we're going to have two assignments, um, paragraphs one through two and then paragraphs three through seven. And then, and then likewise down the line here. So there will be, um, if we continue to be a online uh, formatted class, please stay in tune with the Google Classroom calendar. That will let you know what assignments I'm going to be posting. As you can see, uh, the amount of work isn't going to be as heavy but it might cause you to ask a lot of questions because we're not going to be in the classroom digesting it together. Uh, so it's going to be a lot more individual, uh, individually oriented as far as the assignments go. So uh, that's just a forewarning. Please be as diligent as you can be with these assignments because it will affect your grade. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and jump in then. I'm going to give you, a, like I said, a kind of brief introduction to the article itself. Uh, I mean the encyclical. Alright, so uh, Domineum et Vivicantum, et vivicantum uh, is the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. This is Christology. So a little background. Uh, it was promulgated as an encyclical on the 18th of May in 1986. So in the history of the church it's relatively new. Um, still has a little bit of age on it. It is aging, but a lot of the material that we're going to cover in here is going to be pretty significant to what we as Catholics really believe as far as how um, Christ exists in his church to the Holy Spirit. Um, John Paul II, St. John Paul the Great now, 
uh, during his eighth year of his pontificate, uh, promulgated this encyclical. And, you know, he was pope for quite a long time. So the eighth year of his pontificate is relatively early on in his papacy. Um, the document is divided into introduction, three parts, and a conclusion. And I'm going to go over those uh, in a summative way, like I said. So a few slides here on uh, the breakdown of those parts. So the first one, the introduction, encompasses the first two paragraphs. Uh, the opening line would be, The Holy Spirit is the divine person. He is at the center of the Christian faith and is the source and dynamic power of the church's renewal. So without the Holy Spirit, the church cannot sustain in holiness. Plain and simple. Uh, this encyclical uses the heritage of the Ecumenical Vatican Council Two as a point of departure. So coming out of the Second Vatican Council, and you can recall when we were reading about Dave Airboom last semester, uh, kind of the writing style and energies and uh, main points that were coming out of Vatican II, this encyclical uh, released about 20 years later is coming out of a spirit of Vatican II. It's kind of a continuation because John Paul II was also quite prominent in the Second Vatican Council. He wasn't yet Pope, and I believe he didn't actually become a Cardinal till after Vatican II. So uh, he's at this point either a, a priest or maybe a young bishop uh, when Vatican II is happening. So he's well aware of what's been going on. All right, uh, to the second part of the document, this is gonna be the section that we deal with in this class. Uh, as you can see, the Spirit of the Father and the Son covers ch paragraphs 3 through 26, so we don't quite finish section 2, but we get a good chunk of it in. Um, the first part illustrates the modes of the gift to the Church and to mankind of the Spirit who gives life. The Pope begins from the center of the history of salvation, the Paschal Supper, during which Jesus promises the coming of another counselor or paraclete. Um, you may remember or recall our celebration of Pentecost here. The Holy Spirit comes after him and because of him in order to continue in the world through the church, the work of the good news of salvation. So Christ ascends into heaven, but leaves us the Holy Spirit in order for us to continue the mission of Christ in the world. The Holy Father, uh, John Paul uh, the Second writes that Christ's departure is in indispensable condition for the sending and the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is not the first sending. The encyclical says that it is a new beginning in relation to the first original beginning of God's salvific self-giving, which is identified with the mystery of creation itself. So this entire time God is in communication, is working for the salvation of us all to be united with him in heaven in different ways. Through creation itself, God the Father gives us life. Through Christ's uh, birth and his passion and his ascending into heaven, it is all part of this plan to save us all. Um, and then the Holy Spirit continues to sanctify, make holy the church so that the church itself or herself, us, could uh, one day be with God forever. With Christ at the price of the cross, which brings about the redemption and the power of the whole mystical mystery of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in order to remain from the day of Pentecost onward with the apostles to remain with the church and the church uh, with the church and in the church throughout her in the world. Um, so basically what that's saying is that uh, the Holy Spirit continues to be the presence of God in the church and through the church. Um, that it salvation doesn't really stop at the at the cross. Uh, yes, we're redeemed and, and we're saved but it's an ongoing uh, salvific plan of God. All right, so that's basically what we're going to be covering in class. I'm going to very quickly just kind of give you the whole spectrum of the document here, um, but basically those are going to be the things that we're going to be looking at because the, basically uh, the, the encyclical moves on to talk a little bit more about the Holy Spirit directly, and since this is a Christology class, we're not going to worry too much about the material that comes after, okay? All right. Uh, the Spirit who convinces the world concerning sin. Uh, this is paragraphs 27 through 48. The, the second chapter contains various considerations on the action of the Holy Spirit with respect to sin in the world. 
Uh, for Pope John Paul II, he says, sin means the incredul uh, incredulity that Jesus encountered among his own and the rejection of his mission and rejection that will cause people to condemn him to death. All right, so sin is what kills Christ, more or less. But he also dies for sin, for our sin. Um, the Pope recalls that Christ did not come into the world only to judge it and condemn it. He came to save it. All right, we have to remember that. Um, he didn't come to condemn and judge the world. He came to save us. Um, and the convincing that the Holy Spirit does in the world relates to sin, has its purpose not merely the accusation of the, of the world and still has its condemnation. It becomes at the same time a convincing concerning the remission of sins and the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is what is present um, in the sacrament of penance. Okay, So whereas the person of Christ exists in the priest who is giving us the grace of forgiveness. It is the Holy Spirit that remains within that situation that convinces us that our sin is bad, but it does not purpose, it does not um, make us um, unworthy of forgiveness. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a couple things here on the, uh, the sins that are unforgivable. So the encyclical starts talking mainly about within the confines of the sacrament of penance and the Holy Spirit's involvement in that. Uh, there are only two sins that Christ mentions that are um, really unforgivable. One of them is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Um, so basically uh, the refusal to accept the salvation which God offers to man through the Holy Spirit so willingly uh, and openly with with full knowledge saying that I do not want this I do not want to be saved this Holy Spirit stuff is bogus right so uh, that would be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit with full knowledge and the other one would be obviously the corruption of the youth all right, <clears throat> uh, this is a very wordy slide, so I'm going to be very quick about it. Um, basically, the spirit who gives life, um, if you would like to read through these bullet points, you can go ahead and pause this video and take the time to glance at it. Once again, this is talking more about how the Holy Spirit fills the church with life. Uh, basically, it is the Holy Spirit that permits and allows the magisterium, the teaching body of the church, to continue to inform and guide uh, all members of the church in holiness and ultimately to heaven. Okay, let's get to that last point here really quickly. The Holy Spirit does not cease uh, to be the guardian of hope in the human heart. The hope of all human creatures and especially of those who have the first fruits of the Spirit and wait for the redemption of their bodies. So the first fruits of the Spirit are the theological virtues that are installed in each one of us, whether we're Catholic or not. We all have the human capacity of faith, hope, and love. And the Holy Spirit is a um, is usually associated with the theological virtue of hope, whereas Christ would be love and God the Father would be faith. Uh, mainly because God the Father is... Uh, the one who speaks to Abraham, the father of faith, and then Christ uh, shows us how to authentically and truly love one another, and then the Holy Spirit offers us hope for eternal life. And then you can see down there, those are my resources I used. I used the, a Catholic Pages summary of the document to kind of help guide this uh, presentation, and then uh, you will also have a link on the Google Classroom of the document itself. All right. So as we're moving forward with this assignment, uh, or this week, um, look to the Google Classroom for guidance and to make sure that you are reading the document and making sure that you're asking questions. A big part of your grade moving forward is going to be uh, asking the amount of questions that I am assigning you to because I will be answering those questions as we're moving forward and hopefully giving you feedback on how we can better understand this document, okay? Because you will have, according to the um, schedule, one quick time here, a report to write on this document. And we will have a review of uh, paragraphs 1 through 24. Okay, So you have to make sure you're answering questions, getting those answers so that you have a better understanding of what's going on in paragraphs 1 through 24. All right? So please read. Keep up with your assignments. Email me if you're having any problems. I will be refreshing my email constantly throughout the days 
that we are um, away from campus. All right? Stay well, uh, stay safe, and God bless.